Hi, I'm Judith Dreyer. Thank you for joining me for this podcast series, The Holistic Nature of Us. My intent is to take us, you and I, into a better understanding of the concepts behind our holistic nature and how that ties directly to the holistic nature of the world around us. How can we connect the dots in practical ways that we are nature and nature's in us? I will be featuring authors and educators, practitioners and others whose passion for this earth helps us create bridges. We'll see what's trending, what's relevant to our world today, not just for land use, but to connect the dots between ourselves and nature. It's time for practical action and profound interchange so our natural world is valued once again. And today I'm delighted to in, uh, welcome Rachel Sayet back with us here at the Holistic Nature of Us. Rachel is a Mohegan tribal member from Uncasville, Connecticut. She's been working for the Mohegan Cultural Department since 2013. And since then, she's also been researching Native American foods. She's also an adjunct professor at the University of Hartford, teaching a Native American cultures class. And she's a busy lady, so I'm so delighted to have her here today to share her wisdom and her knowledge about Thanksgiving and the history of Thanksgiving and food. Welcome, Rachel. So, Bethany, thank you, Judith. So Happy let's start with you. Um, I know you'd like to talk to us about the true uh, history behind Thanksgiving from your cultural perspective. Yes, and also from a historical perspective. So the modern day Thanksgiving holiday as we know it today is, you know, based on a myth of, you know, friendship, which in which the 1621 feast was kind of a happy gathering, you know, a friendship between what people call the pilgrims and the Indians, which really we're talking about Puritans and other types of settlers, as well as the Wampanoag specifically you know the Wampanoag are the tribe and they have multiple groups within Wampanoag um, they're the tribe that were in Plymouth and are in Plymouth as well as throughout the Cape Cod region we have the Mashpee Wampanoag we have the Herring Pond Wampanoag we also have the Aquina Wampanoag or Gayhead Wampanoag out in Martha's Vineyard so those are all subgroups of the Wampanoag tribe which were that group that people think of when they think of that first Thanksgiving Although, unfortunately, many people don't even know the tribal name, even though they are one of the most famous Native tribes. And that's part of the problem with our school curriculums is that they're not teaching that history. They're not even telling people what tribe it is, let alone, you know, what really happened. And I have many friends who are Wampanoag, and I've done a lot of work with them. Um, I actually wrote my entire master's thesis on that tribe and their traditional stories, and you know, they, they just have just such a wealth of knowledge. And there's actually a book that um, I would recommend to people that I, I don't know how easily available it is, but it's called Many Thanksgivings, Teaching Thanksgiving, Including the Wampanoag Perspective. And it's published by the Boston Children's Museum. And it's got a lot of great information from um, Wampanoag tribal members, quotes and things like that. And I can share maybe a quote later. So, you know, when you look back on that, original time period, it was a time of some friendship and some, you could call it peace or you could call it peaceful relations between the settlers and the natives, because this is the early contact period. We're talking about the time when the settlers are really trying to make an impression on us saying like that we are, or that they're here to be friendly and that they're trying to, they're trying to get the land. They're trying to get the resources. They're trying to do all these things. So you know, they're basically tricking the natives into thinking that they are friendly, and some of them were, right? I mean, some people, you know, say that Winslow and Metacom, who was the chief during King Philip's War, that they were friends, and, you know, things like that. And there were definitely, you know, relationships and alliances built throughout that time period. However, um, or actually, sorry, Massasoit was the chief in the early time period, Metacom was later. Mm -hmm. But there were definitely alliances and, and friendly relations built. And then as the time went on, it got worse and worse. The colonists would encroach more and more upon the land. The same thing that was happening here at Mohegan, you know, signing, you know, signing documents, acknowledging that, you know, we'll give you this much, but they're really going to take this much. And it's really, it was never, um, it was never a fair situation 
throughout the history of the colonization of this country, as many people know. Because, you know, when you look at the amount of native land that's left, there's not very much. So it just kept happening. They kept encroaching more and more. Um, you know, they're building their their houses. They're doing this. They're doing that. And as you're, you know, as the natives are seeing all this, you know, they're wondering, okay, what's going on exactly? Like, you know, this doesn't even feel like our homeland anymore. You know, these pigs are being brought in. Animals that, you know, disturb the environment, as I mentioned in the last podcast. All these things are happening. And we're talking about really just a period of 50 years or so where things change so drastically between those early 1600s and the late 1600s, just a couple generations. And it's just, it's crazy to even imagine what it would be like to be part of those, part of the Wampanoag tribe in that time period. And there's also a film, um, the PBS documentary, We Shall Remain, which is a good one, has three parts. And the first part is called After the Mayflower. I just showed that to my students. So it gives you a very, very quick overview of that time period. Um, so when you look at Thanksgiving specifically, what it was known to be was really a three-day meeting to negotiate land, and it was really only hunters and warriors present. Uh, there were some women that came later on, and it was known that, you know, there were a couple deer that were shot. There were a few deer shot for the meeting, so they could have some food and things like that, and there are various accounts out there of the foods that would have been eaten, and people say there was obviously the deer, and then there could have even been some lobster since that was so plentiful, um, you know, things like squash and things like that, um, you know, when we're talking cranberries, all that stuff was readily available, and there are varying accounts of what was actually eaten. Most likely no turkey, because turkey at that time period was very stringy, tough. It wasn't the type of turkey we would have today. We didn't even really eat turkey much because it wasn't something that was really – you know, didn't have a lot of meat on it, and it'd you know, probably be more similar to some of the ducks we would get the way the turkey was back then. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that it's important for people to realize that, yes, there was a time of somewhat of friendship and these peaceful relations, but it didn't last long. And what wound up happening right after Thanksgiving were various, various massacres throughout New England, mm-hmm. horrible mm-hmm. wars and massacres. And what the colonists would say every time that they had one of these battles, which they would win, they would call it a day of thanks, Mm -hmm. a Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And so basically Thanksgiving is founded on murder and not on friendship because, Mm -hmm. you know, the the actual holiday wasn't enacted till a couple hundred years later. And after that, there were hundreds of battles, hundreds of Indian wars, and they were all called Thanksgivings in the early 1600s. So we're talking about, you know, the Pequot War, which was a massacre of all these Pequot you know, men, women, and children, and after that, a day of thanks, right? They feasted. Mm -hmm. And then, again, King Philip's War, which is known to be the bloodiest massacre in New England history, and that was when we were going into the 1670s. So we had, you know, Massasoit, who was the famous leader in the early, you know, early 1600s, and then his son, Medicom, who became the chief um, later on. And he was the one who King Philip's War is named after, People knew him as King Philip because he, you know, he spoke English and, he, you know, he knew all these things. He was diplomatic. So that was just his other his other name. And basically what happened during that time period was the land had been encroached upon so much, so much had changed that people were sick of it. And they started fighting back and they started burning, you know, Puritan villages and things like that. And for a while, you know, they had the upper hand, but very, very quickly that turned on them and. During that war, so I won't get into too much detail, um, you know, there were all different tribes involved. We're talking about all of New England, plus the Mohawks. And it's crazy to think about it because, you know, you're just thinking about how people are getting back and forth and everything. <laughs> you're right. Uh-huh. But um, it was we were all part of that war. And Mohegans, this was one of the things that, for me, you know, really stuck with me when I first started researching my history more, because I, you know, really began this work in graduate school, I, I grew up with the traditions and the stories, but not so much with the battles and the wars. Mm-hmm. So when I was working at the Peabody Museum in 2008, and I actually put together, this is when I started doing research on these Wampanoags, I put together an exhibit on their Indian college at Harvard, and um, that's a tragedy in its own, uh, where Wampanoags attended this Harvard Indian college, and it basically was founded in order to raise money for the faltering school. And 
four of them attended and only one survived to graduate because of the diseases and everything. And then that person died right after graduation. Wow. So it's a tragic story. Um, however, you know, I learned a lot about, you know, everything that was going on in that time period. And the Indian college is just a crazy thing to think about. Cause you're thinking like, okay, there's colonists going to school there. There's natives. And then there's all these wars breaking out. I couldn't even imagine. Um, but that they had us read, you know, a lot of the history as we were putting together the exhibit because we were kind of starting out on this. And I said, oh, my God, Mohegans were, you know, chopping off fingers and hands of our Narragansett relatives. Um, you know, I'm part Narragansett myself and things like that were happening during King Philip's War. And, you know, I just didn't know. I didn't know all of that. I knew that we had friended the colonists because, you know, that's, you know, people know Mohegans as, you know, Uncas, friend of the English. That's our history. And it's hard to grapple with sometimes because, you know, we all they all made these decisions for a reason. All of these leaders. And, you know, he was a great leader. But we look at the Pequot War, we look at King Philip's War and we're, you know, we're slaughtering our relatives. And it still trickles down till today. And other tribes have these same issues where it's like there's still, you know, some deep animosity and some people from these ancient wars. Mm-hmm. Um, so. There, there's a lot to learn about, you know, all of that stuff. But in terms of Thanksgiving itself, I think it's just the concept that, you know, it wasn't this happy-go-lucky thing. It was a meeting, and there were land negotiations happening, and there was all different types of indigenous foods being served. We're not exactly sure 100% which ones were the, were there, but we know that some of those basic Thanksgiving foods were there. You know, we didn't have regular potatoes and sweet potatoes, most likely, because they're not really from here. They're from farther south, you know. Mm -hmm. So that wouldn't be something we would have. Beans, most likely there were some beans there. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what's interesting about the story? I just came across and met Larry Spotted Crow Man, who wrote the the book, uh, The Morning Road to Thanksgiving. And that's not morning... M O R N. It's M O U R N I N G. Morning Road to Thanksgiving, which I highly recommend to our listeners to get, because it's um, it's a great story, but the history's there, and I think that's what I feel sad about is that there's a lot of history missing in our school system. We we tend to romanticize certain aspects of our history um, without understanding the detail behind our history, and I I appreciate what you're sharing with us because in Larry's book too, he talks about the uh, the massacre of the Pequots and the people that were running the churches and the government at that time. And this is in the 1600s. Said it's a day of Thanksgiving for us. We are the conquerors, and I think that mentality is shifting and changing. We we can no longer exist on this planet as command, control, and conquer. We're really looking for ways of being grateful, appreciate, and sustainable. And that's what I like about the work that you're doing and the messages that you have. Definitely. Yeah, and Larry's a great guy, amazing storyteller, writer. I We actually, in, in the Mohegan Library Book Club that I was running, we actually read that book and, and brought him in, um, I think in March, actually. And we had a little native feast with some wild rice and different things served, and he... Um, he loved it. He had such a fun time, and he actually was just enjoying catching up with people because I guess some of the tribal members at my tribe were some of the folks that he had gone out and done mm-hmm, talks, mm-hmm. training talks with when he uh-huh. was a kid. Uh-huh. So he had a really fun time. But um, but yeah, I like that book, and it's also really great for kids. And when you look at the morning, that that word morning. So that's the other point I wanted to bring up. So there also is a, an event called a nas- the National Day of Mourning that takes place every year in Plymouth, and Many Native people choose to go there instead of celebrating with their families, while others, you know, still choose to celebrate the harvest with their families. Um, They may not, you know, think of it in the way that the general public thinks of it in, you know, that happy-go-lucky way. But they, you know, my family celebrates Thanksgiving each year just as a harvest kind of thing. And the National Day of Mourning, I believe that it was started in the 70s around the time where we're having American Indian movement and things like that popping up. And nowadays there's uh there's performances that go along with it, there's marches, and I think you can find all the information online. So if people wanted to attend it, it's open to the public mm-hmm. and and it's it's I've always wanted to go, I haven't gone yet, but mm-hmm. it it seems like an amazing thing and it's you know, it's more of just, you know, 
recognizing what happened here at Plymouth Mm -hmm. and you know, yes, there'll still be food. There'll still be kind of some celebration component, but it's more, you know, praying for those ancestors, recognizing what actually happened. Right, right. And, you know, um, Joseph Bruchak in his book, Keepers of Life with Michael Caduto, he talks about celebration and appreciation. So what I see as the healing for Thanksgiving is to get beyond the grieving is for us to connect in a different way, to connect from a true place of appreciation for the natural world, for our connection to each other, that we really are all one. And I know we're getting there. We're not there yet. But being stewards of the earth, keeping strong for future generations, and keeping in mind that any celebration joins us together and We all want the same things, you know. I think we all want to have prosperity and good family relationships and good jobs and all that good stuff. So um, for me, I see the healing of Thanksgiving um, being into more of a, a deeper understanding of appreciation, especially from the Native tradition, because every day is a day of Thanksgiving, not just one day out of the year. Right, and that's and that's another thing, and I spoke about this a little bit in the last podcast, but you know, traditionally, we as indigenous people, we would have multiple Thanksgivings. We would have a Thanksgiving, you know, we wouldn't call it Thanksgiving, but every every moon cycle, we would celebrate the season. And so now we're coming into, or we are in actually uh, the hunting moon. And this is a, according to our, our Mohegan traditions, we have, um, you know, these moons that are kind of in place. Mm-hmm. And so what what is said about the hunting moon actually is that Mohegan hunters watch the autumn sky for the eternal hunt of the sky bear. In the fall, the cosmic hunter Orion slays the great celestial bear, Ursa Major. Mm-hmm. When the bear is roasted, his blood and fat fall to the earth, coloring the leaves on the trees from green to crimson and gold. So that's kind of, you know, one of our stories that goes along with this time. Oh, I like I like that because, again, there's a teaching in there, you know. I would think that if they're paying attention to the sky bear, they know that it is the time to hunt, and it has to be in a certain place in the sky to signal that time. And, you know, we have to remember that the indigenous folks didn't have um, encyclopedias and textbooks to keep track of things so they were very aware with their oral tradition of paying attention you know paying attention to the elements to the sky to the stars right exactly and I know yeah we've talked about you know just trying to we have to all kind of force ourselves to do this on a daily basis now and you know it's important and another thing that um that goes along with that another kind of saying which they say regards to the hunt and a lot of this is from my great aunt Gladys Tantequidgen, who recorded many of these kind of miscellaneous uh, nature folklore type of things. She, they, she, they wrote, We never hunt on new moons, which we can hang our powder horns. Such moons are wet and full of water. When the points of the moon turn downward and the water runs out, the hunter knows he may set out on his journey, destined to meet with fair weather. There you go again, another teaching but done very poetically, too. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like that very much. Do you um, you have anything to add about some of the traditional foods for the holiday or for this time of year? Yeah, I about the foods, and then I have a prayer that I could share, too, um, the the Haudenosaunee address. I can share some of that, which we've done, the Iroquois Haudenosaunee address, sometimes in my family as well. Mm-hmm. which they speak at meetings, they use that address, and I think that would be good to share with folks. Oh, I'd love and, that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then in terms of in terms of foods, I mean, my family's kind of funny because I have, my grandmother is the Mohegan side, and my grandfather is actually a Mayflower descendant. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Wow. <laughs> like many of us in New England. Right. And so they're cute, and they, they've they always had the little Pilgrim and Indian little salt shakers at their house, um, you know, which is questionable, but, you know, it's a different generation. And they say something like, when my grandfather came here, my grandmother was here to meet him, like when the ships came in, and they have these cute little things that they say. And, you know, it's nice in a, some, some way, it's right, it's like, okay, that's, that's the positive, like bringing it together and, you know, acknowledging that we're all connected and we're all here today. Right. But at the same time, that's not really what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, 
In terms of the food, we mostly eat kind of the traditional Thanksgiving foods with my family, and we've done other things on occasion. Like one year we had lobster, which was fantastic. But mm-hmm. like, oh, let's do let's do this. It's probably more traditional. Or one year we had venison and things like that. So we'll change it up. But for the most part, they're pretty much the the traditional turkey, you know, mm-hmm. stuffing that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, there are definitely some some native recipes that I could share. Uh, one thing that I did this week, which was really fun, was I I run this native food discussion group for Mohegan, and we did a little farm tour on Wednesday of Huntsbrook Farm in Waterford, Connecticut. And the farm owner, Digga, was nice enough to prepare a meal for us. And he knew that, you know, the Mohegan elders were coming. And I recently gave a talk at Abenaki back uh, at the end of September. I went out to Maine. And amazing, amazing experience where they had a whole traditional clam bake prepared for me. Mm-hmm. You know, local oysters. Everything was local out of their waters. Just beautiful. And they gifted me with some some ancient squash, um, a 1,200-year-old seed variety. Oh, my goodness. That is yeah. such a treasure. So it was amazing. And they gave me some corn varieties, too. And so it's actually a pumpkin. It's called Algonquin squash. But it's actually, you know... It, it tastes more like a squash, I would say, but it's called a pumpkin. <laughs> you know. Hmm. So anyway, so Digga, I gave it to Digga because I said, you know what? Why don't we just do this for the for the food group? Why don't we, myself, the elders, we can all share in this? And so he stuffed it with venison, and and it was really good. It was definitely not as sweet as what I would have thought the squash mm-hmm. would have been. Mm-hmm. But I've seen that recipe kind of in different places. You know, the stuffed pumpkin. I've mm-hmm. had it before. Um, Sherry Pocknett, who I mentioned before, the Mashpee Wampanoag cook, she will do, you know, it's stuffed with wild rice and cranberries and things like that. Again, I don't know how traditional these recipes are, but we would have had those ingredients. A lot of our recipes were so basically simple back then, you know, a lot Mm -hmm, of times mm -hmm. there were definitely stews and things cooking throughout the day, but a lot of it would have been right. We would have just like cooked the clams or we would have just cooked the venison over the fire. A lot of it was just very simple. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nowadays, people are just kind of fusing things together more with the native foods. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I, you can find varying recipes on that stuffed pumpkin one. Sherry actually, she did a feast at Foxwoods two years in a row where she did a traditional native feast. And again, traditional being that she used the ingredients that were traditional. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. she had the pumpkin thing, but she also had rabbit and she had, you know, some pheasant and she had Mm -hmm. geese and all different, you know, it was, it was a huge feast. But it incorporated a lot more of those game ingredients that we probably would have seen at that first Thanksgiving. Right, right. Sounds great. Well, um, from here, let's go into the the prayer that you wanted to share. Great. So some of you may have heard this. The Haudenosaunee, again, uh, the Iroquois, their traditional name is the Haudenosaunee, and the Iroquois are the Six Nations. A lot of them are in upstate New York, go out into Canada and my tribe, the Mohegan, we actually lived amongst the Haudenosaunee for quite a while. So we have many similar similar traditions and things like that. But this really just, you know, it brings it brings to light just that that grateful thankfulness, that that gratitude that that you're speaking of, that we all need to kind of engage in in daily life for the plant life, for the animals, things like that, for everything, for the earth. So I'll just read a couple of them. Because this prayer is pretty long, so I'll just read a couple lines. The people. Today we have gathered and we see that the cycles of life continue. We have been given the duty to live in balance and harmony with each other and all living things. So now we bring our minds together as one, as we give greetings and thanks to each other as people. Now our minds are one. The Earth Mother. We are all thankful to our mother, the Earth, for she gives us all that we need for life. She supports our feet as we walk upon her. It gives us joy that she continues to care for us as she has from the beginning of time. To our mother, we send greetings and thanks. The waters. We give thanks to all the waters of the world for quenching our thirst and providing us with strength. Water is life. We know its power in many forms. Waterfalls and rains, mists and streams, rivers and oceans. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to the spirit of the water. The plants. Now we turn toward the vast fields of plant life. As far as the eye can see, the plants grow, working many wonders. They sustain many life forms, 
With our minds gathered together, we give thanks and look forward to seeing the plant life for many generations to come. Now our minds are one. Can I do one more? Yes, please. Do. That's beautiful. The food plants. With one mind, we turn to honor and thank all the food plants we harvest from the garden. Since the beginning of time, the grains, vegetables, beans, and berries have helped the people survive. survive. Many other living things draw strength from them, too. We gather all the plant foods together as one and send them a greeting of thanks. Now our minds are one. Beautiful. Thank you for that. That's lovely. And we'll have a transcript of the, re- of the recording anyway, and we'll have these um, sources uh, listed in there for our listeners as well. That's beautiful. Do you want to leave us with your contact information? I know you're a busy lady. You teach all over the place. Um, but how can folks reach you? Yeah, sounds good. So my website is www.rachelsayit.com. My email is rbsayit at gmail.com. And you can check my website for future lectures and events. I'll be doing a talk at Yale this coming Tuesday. Um, and that, well, that would be, I don't know what day this airs. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Uh, this coming Tuesday. So it'll be, at, um, it'll be put on after Thanksgiving, um, for okay. Thanksgiving rather. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so you can check my website for the upcoming events. I'm actually going to be in, you know, Philadelphia coming up in a couple different places. But feel free to reach out to me if you have questions or if you need recommendations on proper books to choose to educate the youth on Thanksgiving and things like that. I have a whole source list for that. Wonderful. All right. Well, I want to thank you again, Rachel. It's it's a pleasure to have you back here. And thank you for sharing your stories and the history. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, this is Judith Dreyer. I'm the author of At the Garden's Gate book and blog. My book is available through my website, which is www.judithdreyer.com, as well as several distribution arms, such as Amazon, Nook, Goodreads, and more. I'd like to remind all of you again that a transcript is available for each podcast. Please like and share them. Let's support each other and get the word out. Remember, now is the time for practical action and profound inner change so that we heal our relationship with this world once again. Enjoy your day.